What's good, everyone? Welcome back to the DeFi Scoop. We had a little bit of a long break. I was traveling for a bit. But this time around, I am very excited for this episode with Mr. Amin Soleimani, Spank Toshi himself in the building. Amin, how are you doing? Great, too. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Pretty sure I see you in Paris. I saw you in Denver. I saw you in New York. I saw you. you're all over the place. You're just worldwide. Yeah, I've been having a good time. Yeah. Um, what did you think of all the conferences so far? The conferences were pretty fun. It was great to catch up with everybody. Uh, mm-hmm. It's been it's been a while. People ask me like what I missed before quarantine. I was like Ethereum hackathons. <laughs> that's like where all my friends hang out. <laughs> yeah. How did uh, MCon compare to like the early uh, Ethereum hackathons? It definitely like it felt like it had a very like idealist anything anything is possible kind of just feel to it. Like, what do you think of MCon compared to the earlier Ethereum conferences? Similar idealism. The early ETH conferences were even possibly more idealistic because there wasn't anything real to point to yet. So it was all a dream. The the MCon conference was also lots of dreaming, but. Uh, rooted in the reality that we have uh, accomplished a lot in terms of DAOs and coordination culture, and people who were there were all like coordination junkies. So it was a it was a good flow, but really in it in it for the culture, in it for the civilizational progress. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So you know, in your coffin speech, um, you talked about you know what Moloch is and kind of like what kind of humanity faces, and that we can never really defeat Moloch, but we can just like kind of just push him back. So like. Can you give like a little bit of a uh, overview of like for people that don't know like what is Moloch and like what do you think are the best strategies to defeat Moloch and like yeah we'll just start with that sure yeah so I started a DAO like two years ago uh, two and a half years ago called Moloch DAO it had a, had a couple goals with it one was spread the meme of Moloch itself uh, another was like help people uh, get over PTS DAO because the DAO hack had just happened and we were kind of scared of doing DAO stuff in terms of Moloch itself the idea there is like I read this blog post. 2016, I thought it was really good, called Meditations on Moloch. And if humanity's problems are most of the ones, you know, most of our struggles are caused by, uh, you know, this like game theoretic equilibriums that we fall into, uh, where, you know, we, we would love to, for example, uh, disarm, you know, globally and move towards taking out our nuclear weapons. We, we, uh, you know, most countries don't want to spend money on guns and bombs and planes. Uh, they would rather spend the money on like healthcare and infrastructure and education. But what, what happens is that if we don't spend the money on the guns and bombs and planes, then like if we all try to disarm, the incentive to be the last person with all the guns is really, really high. Uh, so we all have to spend money on guns and bombs and planes uh, to protect against that. And so we're in this like worse off equilibrium. The name for this pattern is Moloch, uh, as as made popular in the blog post. And once you see it, you sort of can't unsee it. Um, <laughs> You see it everywhere. You're like, why does this suck? It's like, oh, because like, you know, the incentives are stacked in such a way that like nobody has an incentive to make this suck less. And like anybody who tries is just overpowered by all of the other <laughs> people, you know, coordinating, you know, to, to maintain the status quo or something like that. Right. And so understanding Moloch is the first step towards trying to fight Moloch. Once you understand why, you know, we can't have nice things, uh, why we can't all just get along, that's actually, it's not, some people might see that and, and, and give up, right? And they might say, oh, well, it's hopeless then, right? And I don't think that's quite true. I think what it means is we just need to upgrade our own coordination infrastructure. We we need to update the narratives that, that we use to coordinate and the technology. And so the, the idea of Moloch is that the, the way to move uh, humanity forward, the way to fight Moloch is to upgrade our own ability to work with larger and larger groups of people in productive ways. And so the way to fight is to build coordination tools. And things like Ethereum are platforms for building coordination tools. The Moloch DAO itself... <laughs> is an mm-hmm. example of a coordination tool, right? It's it, yeah. it made the technology of being able to run this organization with its rules encoded in 400 lines of solidity on the Ethereum blockchain uh, that was able to, you know, hold money and spend money via proposal and also protect minority, you know, rights to exit with your remaining capital via the rage quit function is, is a step in the direction of advancing coordination, right? It's mm-hmm. a lot easier to set something like that up than it is to set up, you know, a non profit that would do 
similar things because you would the the jurisdictional stack uh, is is much more complicated. You have to make a company, you have bank accounts, you have you know trustees, people like how do you enforce something like a rage quit, right? It's like you you have to build that into this contract so that somebody wires money in the bank when you do you know something, and then like how do you authenticate people? Like you, you don't get the advantage of having like digital signatures and and you know cryptography for all, all your communications. There's a lot of advantages to using uh, something like Moloch DAO, and, and the point of building it was was to you know inspire people not only with the meme but also demonstrate like how you would potentially use the technology to advance the culture of, of you know fighting Moloch and building building up coordination. Yeah, to me, like from just listening to you and studying Moloch on my own, like it seems like the two ways to defeat Moloch is one to remove as much human agency as possible, removing as much like points of failure as possible, which, you know, things like blockchain, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum, that's what they do. And also just having absolute faith in a concept. Like one example that you gave in the past of, you know, a way that humans have coordinated successfully, regardless of just, you know, language or where they're from or anything like that is time. Like no one disputes time, but we all use time to, uh, you know, go plan our lives and go about our lives. So do you know of any other, how is time, like in your own words, a way of like fighting Moloch? And do you know of any other examples that, you know, humans in the past have used to fight Moloch? Yeah, time is one of those amazing things. Uh, it's this like great universal protocol. Like imagine how hard it would be to like do anything if like we didn't all use the same like time standard, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and time is kind of beautiful because it, it transcends language, uh, it, tra it transcends culture, right? And and so like other types of things, you know, protocols for coordination are things like language, uh, things like names, stuff like that. Lots of internet protocols, you know, HTTPS, right? Encryption itself are, are like that too. The, it's hard to build something as good as time. Uh, yeah. The, <laughs> the, the time is so good also is because like my use of time doesn't take away from your use of time. It's, it's non-rivalrous. Right. And like, I wish Ethereum block space was also non rivalrous. Um, <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> but unfortunately, you know, it is it's limited capacity. And, and so there, there are, you know, limits. And that's why scalability is so important. But I think even even things like, you know, something like an Aave. Right, where uh, something like Maker, you know, mm -hmm. um, we with Ethereum and, and with assets on ETH, we have sort of transcended language uh, at, at the level of the financial protocols that we can use. It, it, it works the same no matter where you're from, right? Um, and and I think that already in and of itself is is an advance because now we're building global first. Uh, we're not building, you know, something for a specific region that has to necessarily be uh, subject to certain like region-specific re regulations and stuff. But we start out tr trying to build first for the world. Um, yeah. So I, I think that's that's a pretty big step forward, generally, generally speaking. It's like stop to think, right? Like how much of our coordination failure with other countries and uh, like comes from not having shared language, right? Exactly. Uh, like if we could all speak Chinese and they could all speak English, or you know, pick one. Uh, Things would be chill. Or Sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and and so that's the kind of thing that like we try to build up protocols that can can cross boundaries uh, that we have because so long as we have those boundaries that's the they sort of set the limit on our coordination potential. Yeah. Um. I'm think like smart contracts whether like whether whatever language they are smart contracts or language like they're unbiased they don't judge they just exist and people utilize them to accomplish their goals by themselves or with others. That's how I just kind of view it simply. Um, mm -hmm. Something I was going to ask, like right now, do you think DAOs and protocols are doing enough to, you know, prevent the Moloch trap, as you say? I mean, it's it's a it's a hard trap. Uh, Moloch always exists in some form, right? If we want to overcome existing status quo Moloch uh, of incentive failures, and we have to like build better incentives ourselves. And, and systems um it's uh, you know uh, uh it's it's a, it's a tricky one to answer like i'll, I'll use an example for like MakerDAO because they they just actually published an interesting proposal uh room the ceo did on their on their forums about mm -hmm. using maker using like Dai uh to accelerate the adoption of you know clean energy by backing Dai with like clean energy bonds and investments and stuff like that uh and i, I think that's interesting like that this is a example of a DAO, maker DAO, you know, the maker holders collectively coming together to if they do this, decide to try to solve like a you know, 
or not necessarily solve on their own, but uh, participate in, 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 in aiding uh, th this this Moloch, which is like climate change, right? Because the, yeah. the climate change problem is like, well, China doesn't want to stop because we already did most of the polluting, and so they need to have their fair share of the time polluting. But the end result is that, you know, it's just bad for everybody on the planet. Yeah. Uh, it's worse off for, you know, countries next to the ocean, uh, and, and, and stuff like that, um, disproportionately so. So, like, how do you address that? Maker, you know, they have their, like, internal Moloch, right, where, where it's like uh, they need to be able to coordinate within themselves and so that they need, you know, alignment. But then it's almost as if they, they might even have a better chance because they're rallying against this, like, external Moloch, uh, which is, like, climate change. They might be better able to coordinate pr to promote die and, and advance the, the reason for die because people, at the end of the day, people like solving Moloch-type problems. Uh, but most people do. Most people do not like to live in coordination failure. Uh, we would all generally prefer if things worked out. <laughs> yeah. No, nobody's going to sit there and be like, man, if only like we, we could not work together on climate change more, right? Like, <clears throat> it's, it's mostly uh, like people... Yeah, I wonder how that would work, because, like, you would have to... I wonder what oracles you would use, and, like, you know, how you would get that information. <laughs> that sounds like, you know, the endeavor to get the information itself on-chain would be, you know, would involve, like, in a sense, like, points of, <laughs> points of failure. Like, I mean, you can have, like, trusted sources and stuff, but they would have to be, like completely unbiased so it's just like you know the more complicated you get you get it's like the more chances Moloch has to rear his head yeah i think you know that that's part of our inspiration for building something like rai rai being a fork of maker dao try to keep it aligned with the initial idealism of you know being backed only by eth uh being largely governance minimized it used to be that the only thing that maker holders voted on was like changing the stability fee up and down a little bit uh, to you know balance the market right and we automated that whole process by adding the redemption rate feedback mechanism so it just responds to market on its own we you know can tweak the parameter but we're trying to remove our ability to even do that the dichotomy here is like you can make sacrifices to allow governance to play a larger role mm -hmm. uh, and when you do that then you always have this risk of governance capture right and for us, when we think about Rai and we think about the monetary system, like we see the Fed as this controller sitting in the middle of this giant system. And they, the, the Fed is, is attempting to stabilize the system. And they have, you know, certain abilities, you know, they, they can uh, change interest rates, buy bonds, the open market operations, stuff like that. But uh, at the end of the day, they're limited by the actions that everybody else takes in response to their actions, right? They're not playing the game in a vacuum. They're playing this game with everybody else on the planet. Uh, yeah. And everybody else on the planet has a lot more money than they do. Uh, and, <laughs> and so they have a... The, 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 their their attempts to stabilize things uh, can sometimes backfire because the, whole, the the way the system ends up working is the whole world is doing the JPOW trade, right? The, the we're all betting on what JPOW is going to do next, right? Yeah. Is, is he, his interest rates sell everything. Is he going to keep inflation? You know, is is not that bad? All right, you know, YOLO long, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the 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 problem is that that means that his job is to keep everybody guessing as much as possible. Uh, because if he ever stopped, let it, you know, if we if we ever had confidence in his next move, then it would be harder for him to and the Fed generally to take action. Yeah. So we're sort of stuck in the system <laughs> where the the Fed has to like professionally gaslight everybody on the planet all the time. Yeah, they have to do order. what's in yeah, do what's like in the best interest of the US and the US economy. And like the dollar right, right now wields so much power at the moment, you know, whether you know it's with Swift or, you know, with you know, the Treasury or with whatever, like you know, at, at some point, like, it's like, when will the jig be up? It's like, I feel like we all know it's coming. I mean, it's just like a matter of when. Yeah. So the, the inspiration for Rai is to try to mitigate that uh, as much as possible mm -hmm. by trying to take the humans out of the control loop. Yeah. Uh, say, okay, we're, we're going to try and remove the governance over this so we can actually do very little to change the system. Whatever we have control over, we're going to try and add time delays and, you know, things that, that make it even harder. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the interest rate setting, we try to automate so that it happens on its own. Ideally, that results in, you know, a system that is more stable. 
by virtue of being more transparent and not having this like weird side game where you're playing the human controller uh, because there is no human controller. They don't have a, a, a significant impact in the system. So you, you know, w when we're thinking about this, these layers of Moloch, right? You're like, you can have the fed Moloch uh, and then, and like, you know, maybe like they should be doing a better job of addressing the climate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, instead of like bailing out yacht uh, companies. Right, mm -hmm. like like cruise liners and stuff, which which they did. <laughs> so, but but then you know, there's this other competing uh, ideology, which is like money shouldn't be politicized, right? Uh, and so Rye sort of has that part of the ideology where it's like we want to politicize money as little as possible. Maker uh, right now has the ideology of if you're going to political, you might as well do a better job of it. And like go, go to the max in. right now, yeah. <laughs> and like you know align that with whatever politics makes sense, which in their case is the you know clean energy uh, support. So you know it remains to be seen if if Rye grows to be as big. Right now, mm -hmm. there's only you know, something fifty sixty million dollars of Rye floating around, but we're it's it's growing. So yeah, um, I just there wanna, are more people. I want to point out, I'm wearing my money god. Sweatshirt. I got the last one, 69th one. I was like, I have to get yeah. this. Luckily, you had it in an extra large. I was like, yeah, so I got the 69th one. I'm very proud of that. Um, yeah, 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 so to get to the next thing, um, how, what is your plan to increase Rye adoption and how has Rye gotten adoption so far? Right. Uh, in terms of getting more Rye adoption, I think it's starting to hit its, find its groove or hit its stride. The projects that are most mostly buying it right now are like you know DAOs and like protocol treasuries so like they uh bought i think something like 10 million dollars of rye recently and that's probably going to be there for a long time uh and that's because they has now trusted you know this system that it's working and, and it's liquid enough and it's stable enough and, and i think the adoption is going to start from there uh mm -hmm. th there's only some end users that like don't care about having a floating stable coin uh probably most end users are still like in dollar land uh in their dollar heads. land <laughs> <laughs> and like they want to be in dollar land and so it might be the case that like protocols that are less sensitive uh to the you know uh, dollar land are the first and for us that's fine uh rye is meant to be a reserve currency for for DeFi, and so the fact that other DeFi projects and protocols are the first users fits right into our plans and and how we think this is, is sort of meant to unfold yeah uh, it makes sense um yeah i always like when i describe crypto to beginners or people like that are in, interested in it like i like to say that we live in an ocean of dollars like our world like our most people view the world in dollars like the laptop in front of me costs like X amount of dollars, like this microphone, like it's so like, it's hard for people to like break that. And then I remember once I like learned about Bitcoin, it was such like an aha moment because for the first time, like you could view the world outside of dollars. And then that was really the first step. And I think, you know, Bitcoin, you know, it's digital gold, so it can't really, you know, adjust in the same way that Rye can. And like, I'm really excited to see where like Rye goes and like, how do you see, you know, Rye evolving? Like you, you have the whole governance process. So it's just keeping along in that governance process until like, I guess it becomes the standard and we don't even think about it. Like people don't think about the dollar right now. Um, on a long enough timeline, you know, it's possible. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, let's see. In, in I, I, I think I think we do proceed with the ungovernance process and like the ungovernance process is is like how do we have meetings where the point of the meeting is to have fewer meetings right <laughs> like like that's that's how we you know want to think about it and even mm -hmm. calling ungovernance is like a mimetic filter to like keep out all the people who are like really excited about governance like we get it like yes it's still actually you know a governance token uh, but we aren't excited about the governance part. Uh, we're actually like we're like very scared uh, by the governance part because we we understand like how much of a risk it can be. Like Compound, uh, you know, a couple of days ago they had a one line bug in like one upgrade contract that nobody saw, even though you know proposals are pending for a week before they're executed, uh, and that cost them. Fortunately, it didn't cost them, but like they printed I don't know something like a hundred million dollars of extra comp and gave it to people, mm -hmm. and that you know, comp holders somewhat. It's, it's not like a fatal blow, they'll recover, it'll be fine. It's it's just like, that's the type of stuff that keeps us up at night, right? So mm -hmm. 
for, for us, it's uh, we believe that the social scalability of Rye can actually be improved by us taking more things out. Because so long as there is a governance uh, process, you do sort of have to trust that group of people to not, you know, screw something up and to protect the system if something does come up. And so trying to, to limit the role of that as much as possible in our case, you know, means that fewer types of attacks are possible and that the ones that are possible might be harder to pull off. Yeah. What do you think are the biggest threats to Rai right now? Probably the biggest threat is that like a couple of us are U.S. citizens and like we're still in the process of decentralizing it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, th I think that, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's not great, the regulatory environment right now, but we, yeah. you know, have plans to try to address this uh, and, and diminish the dependence on any particular person or jurisdiction. Yeah, it seems like aggressive is an understatement right now. Um, but, you know, Gary Gensler said, I think yesterday or two days ago, that he does not plan to ban cryptocurrency. So what do you think of that statement? I think it's a positive statement. I, I think that he is getting some pushback. Uh, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm happy about the pushback he's getting. Like uh, somebody called him out and was like, "Look, if you like try to, you know, uh, t t like what, like it's like how would you even get Uniswap like listed on a securities exchange, right? Like, yeah. They don't even have the custody available. And this, this it was a congressperson calling him out on these points, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh, they're making all good points. They're they're right across the board. It's like <laughs> U.S. like financial system doesn't even have the infrastructure to support like the kinds of network uh, assets that we are using. So it's like, it, it's sort of a nonsensical position that we're in right now where, where they're trying to fit everything in, you know, the old the playbook. Old system. It doesn't exactly fit and it's, you know, causing them a lot of consternation. Yeah, it's going back to Moloch. It seems like even though cryptocurrency has been around for over a decade, we've still yet to, you know, create the infrastructure or like infrastructure regulations to like, you know, look at over this stuff properly. Like it's years and like, we don't know if we're like doing anything wrong. Like the SEC refuses to define like if something's a security or not. Like, do you think at this point, like the US regulatory landscape is a victim of Moloch because of all this friction? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there are certainly weird incentives at play. At least some of the moves seem explicitly intended to counter the loss of deposits from private banks to crypto startups and, and platforms, right? Like the Coinbase Lend thing, you know, they they were going to offer Lend to get, you know, some fixed interest, uh, you, know, you know, savings accounts or, or whatever for, for users on, on their deposits. And like mm -hmm. SEC threatened to sue them, uh, which is like you know, most aggressive. Like they tried to talk to them and the SEC was like, no, we're not talking to you. We're only suing you. And it's like, why would they do that? <laughs> and it's like, because it seems that it's probably because they're, whole, you know, trying to pop up the private banker Ponzi for, yeah. you know, as long as long as they can to extract whatever dollars they can out of it and the inability for people to create new banks because charters haven't been issued you know in a long time there's a, there's a moloch there right yeah <laughs> yeah the, the moloch there is that you know it, it would seem that the banks are coordinating to uphold their interests for as long as possible and strangle the the emerging new financial system which is more transparent and uh more equitable uh, than what they have going on and, and just honestly a better product right it doesn't doesn't make sense why i should pay three percent every time i send money it doesn't make sense why like the way they do wire transfers and it takes all this time and th there's a lot of advances in, in crypto that are much more competitive like, or even like privacy protocols like tornado cash and things like that right yeah i would I would want to live in a world where like this stuff was pretty widely adopted and not looked at as like weird, right? Yeah. It, it should be I, weird to not want privacy. <laughs> yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Like every time I hear the words investor protection, I just think of like mafia movies and like mobs coming like to business saying like, hey, we're here to protect you. But in reality, oh, yeah, they're, yeah. Just, they're just like holding them back. Like, I mean, I don't think anything is more blatant than the DYDX airdrop which like, you know, all these people were protected from like potentially like hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's absurd. Like at some point, like where, where do people like draw the line? Yeah, we're, we're optimistic that, you know, we'll be able to deliver the, the promise of Rye and, and not yeah. have too much trouble, but you know, we're, we're very aware of the risks. Yeah. I think, to mitigate. I think like what, you know, this whole space that we're in is about is building parallel systems to the one that we are now. 
and like giving people you know the option to opt out of like things that aren't working to things that you know actually do work there's also a lot taken for granted in, in like credit worlds and banking worlds right like there's a fact that i learned uh not not too long ago surprisingly which was that women couldn't get credit from a bank until 50 years ago, unless it was in a man's name. Uh, like they, they needed a man with them to get credit, right? And, and, and that's like one of those things that's like, like not great, you know? <laughs> yeah, we, don't, we don't even think twice about that. Yeah, a lot, a lot, you know, most, most men don't really think about that too hard. And like, I, you know, I didn't until I realized that. And then, and then, and then it, it puts things in perspective a little bit more because then you're like, oh, actually like these no hassle credit against your asset systems, right? The lending protocols, the Aves, the, the makers, the Rise, you know, the, these things actually have this impact where like this is better for, you know, for, for women because they don't need to go through like the patriarchy you get a loan. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. Like, They're unbiased systems, which is uh, right. what defeating Moloch is all about. Um, right. You know, and uh, you, you use the example of women. Like, I think, like, a lot of Americans don't, I mean, they take for granted, like, you know, access to credit as well. Like, you know, people in developing countries, they don't have, like, the same access to, like, you know, credit to, like, grow their business or, like, take out a loan for, like, a house or, or something. But, like, with Ave or with, you know, what I'm really excited about is to see, like, Ave and Compound and these lending protocols be used in the real world for like, you know, people, whether they're women or developing countries or minorities to like use them to like advance themselves in ways that they couldn't uh, in the old system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing I was going to say is like, you know, I've heard you in the past, like, you know, people like to compare blockchains and like how to like, you know, get people to understand blockchains better. You have described them as public utilities in the past. Um, I was listening to Hasib on a podcast yesterday called them, uh, cities like what do you think is the best way to like compare like what to uh, compare blockchains to i think cities is, is, is probably a good good abstraction good analogy right mm -hmm. like a city can grow and then it becomes more valuable and the real estate within it becomes more valuable and like that's kind of like ethereum block size you know as it's or block space as, as 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 people are bidding more to participate cities have suburbs right <laughs> side chains <laughs> l2s yeah side chains and l2s right people like go in to the city, do stuff, and then go back to the suburbs and then do their like local stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think on a long enough timeline, you'll see more localized settlement layers. In theory, not everybody on the planet needs to know and verify like if I send you money, yeah. right? Like maybe we have our own like subnet or something and like we verify our subnet and then like that eventually gets rolled up into, you know, the main chain. I also sort of expect like Ethereum block space to just get completely filled up with like roll up verification stuff. So mm -hmm. like almost everybody that's on it right now is going to get priced out. Like I, I sort of expect like anything less than $10,000 to turn into dust. Yeah. Uh, I expect to like maybe tell my children one day that like we used to transact on mainnet in the good old days. <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned roll ups. Like what do you think of the current state of roll ups right now? Like, you know, Arbitrum is live. I believe Starkware said that their mainnet's going to go live in November. Um, so what's your opinion on all the rollups coming out? Mm, uh, I think Ethereum scaling is happening before our eyes. I don't have a too strong of an opinion between like Arbitrum, Optimism. They both seem like Ethereum to me. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's the like sort of application specific side chains uh, that Starkware just launched with like Immutable X and DYDX. Mm-hmm. Those also seem pretty cool, and Starkware I think is launching their like open alpha. So I think I think rollups are sharding, uh, just done right. Sharding I don't think sharding was ever actually going to work. I, mm, like why not? I think everyone was always going to end up on the first shard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like where, you know, yeah, it's like everyone's going to go. So it, like I, th I think it was an important ideal to to sort of align the community around advancing to this multi shard world. But then the actual execution of that came from the root of like the plasma research that was done. That mm -hmm. first went into you know plasma, and then like all the variants of plasma, and then they sort of realized that wasn't going to work out, and they realized that statistic rollups were a thing. And then they go into root zk rollups, and that ends up being like the actual thing that works efficiently within the you know constraints of how much data can you publish to the chain, and how many transactions per second can you do on the layer two. And I think that's where it hits its sweet spot. And so I think that's just what shards are going to be. Uh, 
it's yeah. like it almost makes it pointless to do sharding because like why would you want it increase your throughput by like 10 times when you already have these like you know roll ups working yeah and i feel yeah. like roll ups are going to get to a point where they have so much activity it's just going to be such a pain to migrate everything to a later to like eth 2.0 like i could see a point where it's just like we, we just accept that you know all the economic activity are just going to happen on these roll ups and whatnot yeah uh, I, I think that's probably the case. Like a lot of economic activity is going to move the roll ups. People are going to figure out what suburbs they want to live in. <laughs> yeah, uh, pretty much. They'll um, like go visit their other friends. Yeah. You know, uh, what do you think is the biggest threat to Ethereum right now? Biggest threat to Ethereum? I mean, there there's, of course, ETH killers. Solana is a popular one. I don't see it as much of a threat in the sense that, like, it can erode some of ETH's potential like market cap in the sense that like it gets applications and developer mind share that would otherwise you know go to ETH and th this is true not just of Solana but all of AVAX and you know all, all of the other layer ones um, Polkadot etc but I, I I don't know I, I don't see that as too much of a threat maybe maybe the bigger threat would be like the Ethereum community itself sort of disbanding mm -hmm. uh but like the the conditions, like most most of the like core Ethereum people are like kind of ideological, uh, yeah. and nothing else really satisfies the same like ideological offering. Part of the reason that I like the Ethereum community so much is because this is a community of people who, generally speaking, want to do like a like good for the world. Yeah, uh, and so it is a community where the message that I'm putting forth of like. Moloch and dystopia and you know for nation failure is something that people adopt and rally around whereas mm -hmm. like in other communities uh they might be more interested in in just like being competitive like themselves and like you know they're it's, it's almost like here, here's the difference it's like i would rather like preach about Moloch in heaven than like go to hell and like everybody there is like already super down with Moloch and they're just like <laughs> trying to figure out how to like exploit it for their own you know gain yeah uh, and you know like the profit maxi culture like doesn't need to be told that there are uh, coordination problems or so they, they don't care they're just trying to make the most for them so they're already like post Moloch right whereas the ethereum community like routinely gets uh attacked by people who sort of play into the ethereum values and then like, aren't necessarily aligned and like have their own agendas yeah and so you know they, they're vulnerable to psyops uh, <laughs> and so like injecting Moloch into the culture was part of the way of uh helping you know people be more aware that there are these psyops uh, yeah that they every, exist yeah not everything is a utopia not everybody's you know necessarily like aligned with the same values that you are yeah right? yeah for sure uh, I, I think the thing that ethereum has done right and since the beginning it's really carved its own lane like to be honest i didn't really like before last i've been in crypto for like four years but like before 2020 i wasn't really involved in ethereum it wasn't until DeFi summer i started using it i'm just like whoa there's like something like actually happening here and then in my travels i met like a lot of the people you mentioned like i would call them ideological but like their ideology just like made sense and they were i think the key is they were thinking long term they're thinking literally decades ahead like you hear vitalik speak he's thinking he's already like pl planning like decades ahead like where is the world heading from now and i think that's like the biggest advantage that ethereum has like yeah in the short term like different chains is gonna, are going to take market share but if they don't carve their own lane then people are just going to get tired and move on to the next one like that's how i've always viewed it i think that's about right yeah um <laughs> We, we like uh, it's certainly the case for us building Rye too. Like when we think about the design, we're like, okay, how do we make this live longer than we do? Mm -hmm. You know, like my goal for Rye is to like be on my deathbed and like look at my phone and be like, yep, the controller's still setting interest <laughs> rates. Oh, man. All right, I'm out. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and that lives beyond uh, you. The beautiful thing of like building on blockchains and stuff generally is that like if you if, you, if it works well, like it might be there forever, right? Like. Just like this time. Is, yeah, it's like, like, like we're, uh, one of the framings for blockchain that I like is like we're at the inception of the transition from an oral uh, history society to like an actual like recorded uh, history. Oh, society. I like that. Because like before all we had are like SQL databases and like web two links that break and like data goes who knows where it, where it ends up. But like on the blockchain, it'll be there like forever. Yeah. Right.
<laughs> yeah, that's a good comparison. Um, you know, one thing I feel like that you brought up is like the, you know, the w- way you were signaling with Moloch. Like one thing, one way humans coordinate is signaling through memes. Like memes are actually like essential of all this. I like to think of memes as like memes are the genes of culture. So like, how would you define a meme, and like, how do you use memes to coordinate, like, in the Ethereum community, and, and I guess in your own life as well? Yeah. Defining a meme, it's like the, uh, it's like the smallest unit of like a cultural memory or something. It's like mm-hmm. it's like the smallest representation of an idea. Mm-hmm. But but of course, you know, me- memes can be layered and, and combined. And, and like you're you're wearing uh, the shirt, right? It's got that Moyai emoji that I picked for Rai uh, because I was like, I spent a bunch of hours. It's like, okay, we gotta we got to find something that's like kind of like a rock, you know, rye stones from the Isle of Yap. That was like their Bitcoin, you know, way back when they rolled mm-hmm. around these stones. Uh, and it, it's not even like the same island, but like there's an island with rocks and, uh, you know, has a boy. <laughs> it connects. It connects, right? It like felt right. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then there's another meme there and that's the money god, right? Uh, and so for that, I was thinking about like, how would I imagine a system that's like, that, 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 like it will outlast me? The point of the system is that I can't control it, right? The point of the system is that it controls me. And and I was like, I would reference that like something like a god, right? And, yeah. and so it's like, oh, this is a money god. We're creating a money god, and the money god has to always win. <laughs> uh, and the always win part is about you know uh, how how the redemption rate or the redemption price and the market price will always eventually reach equilibrium. Uh, the the de facto belief that you have uh, in 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 Rye is that like the market will eventually reach equilibrium, and that's why it makes sense to arbit you know one way or another when it falls out of equilibrium. Yeah. Uh, and, and so by combining these memes, we're able to you know convey this idea, idea in a way that sticks, right? Mm-hmm. I, like good memes are sticky. You know? Yeah. Like for sure. Once you, hear it, you don't you don't forget it. It captures that frame the viewpoint you know whatever it is that you're trying to convey did the similar thing for Moloch Dao. the the Moloch meme was important to me to to make it the the name and there were people who were, didn't like it right yeah uh, i remember those people <laughs> so uh again this is like a mimetic filter right so i i also use memes not necessarily it's like curation is really important and so like using the right meme is good because uh it keeps some people out uh yeah might not want uh, because you're trying to coordinate with some other people, and so uh, the the meme of Moloch was intended to cater to people who are like down with a punk rock, you know, ethos or a charity. At the end of the day, because what Moloch did was give you know uh, open source software grants to Ethereum developers to advance you know, the protocol, give the first grants to Tornado Cash, things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, th- th- there are a lot of people that are like, "This is weird. I don't like this." those people did not join and they would never have liked the blog post and they would have opposed everything that, you know, we stood for uh, in, in trying to help not only promote, you know, the DAO itself, but also this meme uh, of Moloch as this great ultimate enemy of humanity, uh, which is not actually an external thing, but is represents all of us and our own inability to coordinate. That was really important for me to convey. And yeah, I didn't want that to uh, be neutered uh, at all. Or, or dilute it, and and so I felt that it was important to just make that the whole brand. Yeah, I think what what it comes down to, whether it's fighting Mo- Moloch or you know spreading our memes in the world, is simplicity matters most. And just like mm-hmm. as long as you can get people to like understand and agree at like the most like fundamental level, then you know that's when you can really get everyone to get along in a way. Whether like it's the meme of time or the meme of names, like you said. Um, and I think, you know, Ethereum in general is like advancing that cause into the future is like in whatever age we are entering. And I hope to like, you know, keep seeing that and keep and make and hope that people take your like words about Moloch and, you know, just like ungovernance seriously in, into their own protocols. Because I think like governance is a meme, like, you know, oh, we have a governance token for this and that and that. But like people don't really talk about like how can we like remove our control instead yeah i'm hoping a lot of the things we do we, we do because they inspire other people to, to also do things so with rai i mean we're, we're hoping to make the point that like you can do this without having humans in the loop and like we're seeing other people starting to use control theory uh to like set interest rates in other places there was a 
Terra Luna proposal to do something for one of one of their lending protocols. I, I think like, you know, we, we, with Rye, we also we just kind of want to nerd snipe people, right? Like, uh, <laughs> we, we want them to like go down the same rabbit hole and like try to uncover, like come to the same sort of epiphanies that we've come to. So, so I think memes memes are even better when they're layered. You, you yeah. can have like a, a, the outer shell of like a meme, and then you have like the payload. <laughs> but like the outer shell is maybe something controversial or something that helps it go more viral. And then the inner payload is like once you have people's attention, then there's there's a message that you're trying to communicate. And and I think that, that's my preferred you know way to use use memes that has worked out for us. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, anyways, do you have like any final thoughts um, or like anything else you want to share? Any like anything you want to say? Become ungovernable. <laughs> yeah, amen to that. <laughs> Become ungovernable. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on, Amin. I really enjoyed this one, and um, I can't wait to see how people react in this one. Cool. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Always a pleasure.